Good afternoon everybody, my name is Yasmin Hussain and in this presentation I'm going to be telling you about the work that I did over the summer to produce my MA dissertation on culture, diversity and the disabled facilities grant. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who contributed to this piece of work, whether in the form of completing surveys, taking part in the interviews or replying to my emails. This in itself is symbolic of what is at the heart of promoting services that effectively meet the needs of all, and that is people. So my interest in this topic came as a direct result of my work at Foundations as a policy executive and increasing work that I've been doing on diversity and inclusion in this job. It was then also helped out by my academic background of doing a master's in peace and conflict studies. Ultimately, what I realised is that conflict resolution manifests itself in different ways, in different countries and in different settings, yet persistently affects minority groups and individuals. Whether it's housing in England or war-torn countries across the world, it's increasingly obvious that individuals experience multiple and overlapping disadvantages, and these are made worse by the structures that we have created. To provide effective services for all and truly tackle discrimination, we have to unpack and improve these structures, which is what I'm hoping to shed light on in this presentation. My dissertation was centred around two focus research questions, which were how is the Disabled Facilities Grant currently responding to the needs of elderly and or disabled individuals from South Asian and Black African backgrounds? And how can lived experience be integrated into the current approach to improve these experiences for these individuals? To investigate this, I used intersectionality as a tool and a method. As the little diagram on this slide shows, intersectionality understands identities such as gender, race, class and ability as interconnected and reflective of social structures of oppression and privilege. Intersectionality aims to translate this theoretical knowledge into practical responses to oppression and the benefits then of using intersectionality is to focus on these experiences of oppression to understand how to minimise and eradicate them. My dissertation argued that housing policy and practitioners in England must employ intersectionality by going beyond a one size fits all approach which silences those typically most marginalised, which in this case is elderly or disabled ethnic minorities. It argued, secondly, that deploying intersectionality by including these experiences in policy formulation and implementation will bridge this gap, ensuring that policymakers are centralising those who they are making policy for. So for some academic background, all Port's theory of social contact suggests that different groups can work together to combat prejudice, but only under certain conditions. This theory is important because it works to combat injustices that we may unknowingly be perpetuating within the sector. Essentially, all ports conditions for these groups collaborating to minimise discrimination includes all parties having an equal status, physical and personal interaction and sharing common goals. I'm telling you this as I use these criteria to demonstrate how we can deploy intersectionality within our DFG practices. I should also note that my research works to promote the social model of disability, which as I'm sure most of you already know, this understands society to be the disabling factor to individuals' lives rather than their disabilities specifically. Whilst this has been criticised for being more like a theory than a practical tool, in doing my dissertation I found some examples of how this model can be used practically by engaging different professionals within the process to contribute towards this understanding of society and disability. I focus specifically on Black African and South Asian individuals rather than ethnic minorities more generally to really contribute to the argument of intersectionality, which looks at specific individual characteristics to understand how to improve these experiences. I also split the research into the sections of policy, practice and lived experience, as I believe that these are important parts of the DFG process and have the potential to work together to promote intersectionality. So I'll now go through what I did to make these arguments. So starting with policy, I analysed all the housing assistance policies in England qualitatively and quantitatively using an intersectional policy tool to do this and understand how local authorities were using policy to engage with ethnicity, culture and diversity. I found that no housing assistance policies mentioned black African or South Asian individuals, but this was unsurprising. So I looked to see what they were mentioning and how frequently. The chart on this slide reflects how many housing assistance policies mention these things, whether that be a clear recognition of local demographics, explicit mentioning of their provision of translation services, 
a specific policy relational to equality and diversity or an equality and diversity commitment or impact assessment. It was clear that some local authorities were going to lengths to deploy intersectional approaches to their policy formulation, as this involved the local authority providing more than one of these items of the chart within their policy. This intersectional provision of a range of culturally sensitive services demonstrates the local authority thinking about these different experiences. 20 local authorities were providing policies that demonstrated this. However, looking at intersectionality requires understanding how these policies materialise in practice. 16 out of 20 of these local authorities had a lower population of both South Asian and Black African individuals than the national demographic. Moreover, many of these local authorities confirmed that they did not do many DFGs for South Asian and Black African individuals, so ultimately this proved that only a few of these culturally aware policies actually materialised into practice, limiting the intersectional benefit of these policies for empowering and helping South Asian and Black African individuals. Next, I interviewed Brent and Oxford City Council as last year's annual Delta survey found that these local authorities were monitoring ethnicity well. Oxford City Council focused more on South Asian experiences, whilst Brent looked more at Black African experiences. Both demonstrate how the Disabled Facilities Grant can be delivered in an intersectional way. To take these findings in turn, Oxford City Council focused heavily on community engagement to do this. Their approach physically identifies the typically excluded and demonstrates all ports guidelines for optimal social contact. For instance, Oxford's handy person services identify potential future clients and staff go to hospital to identify these individuals. They work with community groups to promote the trust building tagline, when in doubt, give us a shout. Oxford also identifies ambassadors based on the ethnic group in question to facilitate trust building. Examples included working with an interfaith group composed of matriarchal group heads following Oxford's recognition that individuals from these backgrounds often live within matriarchal settings and including service users from these backgrounds who have received a DFG to foster and champion a trusting relationship between these communities and their service provider. Oxford City Council also employ the flexibility expected of local authorities when providing the DFG to innovatively meet individuals' needs. So Oxford have included a clause within their housing assistance policy, which allows the adoption of different adaptations which diverge from conventional adaptations if approved by the head of service. Additionally, Oxford's Equalities Impact Assessment has been locally developed to deeply understand how this lens specifically impacts ethnic minorities. Brent, on the other hand, have employed intersectionality to effectively represent the experiences of their ethnic minority residents and challenge their marginalisation. Brent's ingrained corporate culture of diversity exemplifies ideal intersectionality and has constructed a legacy of inclusion which transcends the disabled facilities grant managers, ensuring that all of Brent deploys the same culture and diversity guidelines. This has consolidated Brent as a space for elderly and or disabled individuals from these backgrounds to engage in optimal social contact with their service providers by promoting a shared and united goal. Brent's highly representative team has enhanced this. For example, Brent's internal culture diversity network composed of both Asian and black staff groups enables its team to increasingly represent those they are providing services to. Their Black Star Forum shares experiences and addresses grievances by examining existing internal ethnicity data to understand the barriers to Black African individuals achieving managerial positions. Resultantly, Brent has created community style groups to address the structural constraints on their Black African staff members. Brent further employs the flexibility expected of local authorities to empower its Black African residents by rec recognising international events such as George Floyd and the pandemic as impetus for local services to collaboratively evolve with health by consequently implementing awareness training surrounding language. Eroding this barrier of negative and inaccurate perceptions have been furthered by Brent by educating both staff and residents about culture locally. This has involved Brent collaborating with community organisations to host community-based events alongside their provision of services. 
French chief executive attending these events demonstrates both top-down and bottom-up interaction to promote positive representation. This intersectionality then increases the physical contact and visibility between the two parties while simultaneously making them more equal and demonstrating Allport's optimal social contact. So finally, I sent out two surveys, one to community organisations and one to occupational therapists to understand how the Disabled Facilities Grant could be delivered in intersectional ways. This survey confirmed that these two groups are optimal candidates for Allport social contact. This is unsurprising given that they both meet the criteria in being in close contact with South Asian and Black African service users. They share a common goal of wanting to empower these individuals and they are also on a more equal status to the local authority than the service users due to being in a professional position to improve these individuals' lives. This was supported by the responses. Both surveys asked respondents to rank various priorities between one and seven, with one being the most important and seven being the least important to meet the disability and housing needs of South Asian and Black African individuals. As evident in this little shared areas of importance box, these, despite the questions provision of other priority areas, both groups prioritise similar areas. This confirms the importance of lived experience and an evolutionary professional and organisational culture to deliver this. These similarities confirm that both groups have a shared goal of applying intersectionality for South Asian and Black African inclusion, meeting all ports criteria for optimal social contact. However, they both do this in different ways. So, Occupational therapists have the capacity to improve the lives of South Asian and Black African service users, whereby community organisations have the capacity to include South Asian and Black African service users to empower them. To explain, 67% of OTs had received culture and diversity training and gave examples of where their personal interactions with South Asian and Black African service users had informed their understanding of good practice. Examples they gave included considering how multi-generational families may overcome means testing restrictions and considering how adaptations may be culturally sensitive or how the DFG could work more flexibly to meet certain cultural needs. This clear understanding of structural barriers to accessing the DFG confirms their employment of the social model of disability to interact with service users. Community organisations also demonstrated using the social model of disability by prioritising customer inclusion within design and delivery, educating communities about the DFG and destigmatising the receiving of help. This provided space for South Asian and Black African individuals to directly voice their own experiences and overcome structural barriers. Clearly, these groups of individuals are in positions to champion the social model of disability and also resemble potential for Allport's theory of social contact. This confirms how professional advocates can improve the delivery of the Disabled Facilities Grant. So following on from these findings, I'm just going to share with you some of the recommendations that have come out of this research and as to how I envision intersectional working of the Disabled Facilities Grant. Regarding policy, Local authorities should proactively ensure that their local housing assistance policies consider local demographics when formulating policy to ensure that it meets the needs of its constituents. Inclusive policy, therefore, includes explicitly committing to equality and diversity, including as much flexibility as possible within the policy, providing the policy in alternative formats and languages and providing interpreters. Local authorities should also work with constituents and community groups to construct an equalities impact assessment, as well as using Foundation's existing guidelines on this, which considers the impacts on the groups within their local areas. Finally, local authorities should update this policy continuously to ensure relevancy to local groups. In regards to practice, local authorities should have staff network groups, either for staff representation or for specific cultural issues, to discuss and address relevant issues. They should work with these groups to actively address structural issues for individuals within the local community. Those working on the DFG should also physically attend local areas such as hospitals, schools, mosques to engage with individuals and encourage their accessing of the DFG through community engagement. 
Local authorities should also work with different community structures, such as matriarchal groups, to inform policy and practice, and they should celebrate a diverse range of cultural holidays and events in collaboration with the local community. Finally, local authorities should work with individuals who have received a DFG from minority groups and use their experiences to champion and encourage more individuals from these backgrounds and these communities receiving help. And finally, in regards to lived experience, it is clear that championing the social model of disability aligns with intersectional approaches to housing and optimal social contact. OTs and community organisations are ideal to champion this. OTs can be professional advocates from within the process, working in close physical contact to understand the needs of these individuals, and community organisations are external platforms for local authorities to identify vulnerable individuals, engage with them, and use this shared goal of wanting to empower them to improve the workings of the DFG. Lived experience is ultimately identified as of utmost importance by OTs and community organisations and should be integrated throughout to deliver optimal social contact. This presentation has aimed to showcase some of the ways in which the Disabled Facilities Grant can be provided to more effectively include and empower all those that it is intended to serve. And ultimately, intersectionality is about looking beyond what is already done to meet these needs and interests creatively and effectively. Thank you so much for listening and have a lovely afternoon.